Russian President Vladimir Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine enters and as its 15th week, last week we passed the 100-day mark. Fierce battles are continuing in the east of Ukraine, which one Ukrainian soldier described as artillery ping pong, according to Joshua Jaffa in The New Yorker, an article I'd like to recommend, as it describes really well the horrors of this war of attrition by heavy bombardment that Russia presents, presently conducts. The battle for control of Severodonetsk is ranging back and forth. There are heavy losses on both sides with the Ukrainian government repeating its call for heavy weapons from its Western backers. Meanwhile, on Friday, the German Bundestag approved the Sondervermögen, the special budget of 100 billion euros for the Bundeswehr for Germany's armed forces. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz visited the Baltic states on Tuesday, reassuring allies that Germany would defend every inch of NATO territory and also signaled that Berlin was looking into increasing the number of German soldiers stationed there. Scholz also insisted that Germany was among the countries doing the most to support Ukraine. At the same time, there was a visit that didn't happen. Um, I just briefly mentioned um, um, that Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov was due to visit Belgrade, but was sort of hindered by on his plans by, by, by not being allowed, his, his plan wasn't allowed to, to, um, to, to overfly countries in, in, on the way. The passing of the 100-day mark has given occasion to estimate uh, the cost of war so far. 20% of Ukrainian territory is presently controlled by Russia, according to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians have lost their lives, are prisoners of war, or have been forcefully deported to Russian territory. According to some estimates, Ukrainian GDP will halve this year, and the destruction brought by Russia's war of aggression on Ukraine's infrastructure alone will require investments of at least 100 billion euros. To discuss all this and more, we have again three experts with us to uh, assess the situation. And to, to start us off, let's turn to Anders. As usual, let me share the map that we often use. So let me share the map prepared by the Institute for the Study of War. So this is the place where the most intense fighting has been going on. Uh, as Henning mentioned, Severodonetsk, here I'm pointing with the mouse, Severodonetsk is right now uh, probably mentioned most in the news. While the most important fighting is not going on only in Severodonetsk, but also uh, in, in the vicinity of this Russian breakthrough, basically uh, west and northwest of Papasna. Uh, bad news, Severodonetsk is almost completely occupied by Russian forces. Ukrainians are controlling some westernmost uh, streets of the, uh, of, uh, of the city or what's left of the city. But unfortunately, the Russian capture of Severodonetsk is a matter of a few more days maximum. From then on, Ukrainian defenses uh, will concentrate or likely to concentrate on the neighboring city, Lysychansk. Lysychansk is occupying a higher ground geographically than Severodonetsk, so it's possible to hold it for a while more. But uh, the main Russian effort will probably not be concentrated on Lysychansk in a frontal attack, because it means that they would have to cross the Siversky Donetsk River, but instead they will try to develop their offensive here from the south and complete the encirclement of the Ukrainian troops fighting here in the easternmost salient, uh, easternmost tip of the Donbas salient. Uh, I think it's quite important to, to realize that the Battle of Severodonetsk is not the Battle of Stalingrad. So even if Ukraine loses it, it will not change the tide of the war. Russia will try to picture it as a decisive victory, but in fact, it will not be won. What's more important, and this might sound a bit rude, but it's, uh, one, one needs to be clear on certain things. What's more important from the perspective of the war as a whole is not the territory. It's the fate of the Ukrainian forces defending it. So the main question is whether Ukrainian forces will be able to, uh, to avoid the strategic Russian encirclement that is getting formulated here in the Donbass area. If we widen our focus a bit, um, there are some good news coming from the north. Uh, in, the, in, in the Kharkiv region, Ukrainians managed to keep the territories that they recaptured from Russia. Uh, Russian artillery is still able to founder the outskirts of Kharkiv, 
but that's basically the maximum. Russia is in the defensive in the Kharkiv front line. And some even better news in the south, in the Kherson region, the Ukrainian counterattack is advancing. Ukraine is gaining more and more territories. Uh, we will see whether Ukraine will be able to sustain the speed of this counteroffensive. Uh, and if we le leave the land territory a bit, probably you all heard the news that there are reportedly intensive Russian-Turkish discussions going on on how to open the port of Odessa to, uh, to the export of grain products from there. Russia is pushing for a solution that Turkey would do the demining and open up the port of Odessa. So from then on, Ukrainian international ships would be allowed to transport grain out of Odessa. This Russian idea is met with an understandable Ukrainian skepticism because it would mean that under the pretext of the grain crisis, Russia would try to get the port of Odessa demined. I mean, the minefields laid by the Ukrainians constitute an important defense to the port of Odessa. So Ukraine is unlikely to agree to this Russian proposal or any kind of proposal uh, before uh, Ukraine would get a substantial number of new anti-ship missiles, which would make sure that even if the minefield is cleared, Russia would not use this opportunity to lay an attack on Odessa or on its vicinity. And when it comes to the, this proposal is going to be new in, in the news in the upcoming few days, that's for sure. This is what Russian communication is now centered upon. So it's very important to see also one more thing. Uh, when Russia is offering a compromise or some kind of a solution to open up the ports for grain export, dear colleagues, we need to be, see, we need to be very clear on that. Grain export is hindered because of only one reason. Grain export is hindered because Russia has invaded Ukraine and because Russia's Black Sea fleet is blockading Odessa and the Black Sea. So one, one shall not get involved into uh, the type of blame game the Kremlin is li likely trying to play in the upcoming days. We need to be very clear to see who, which country is the main reason why grain export to Odessa cannot progress. Um, last thing, the military situation in the Donbas is getting really grave for Ukrainian forces. Now, of course, the fog of war applies. There is quite hard to get reliable open source information that would be, that would be very, very actual, but there are more and more signs uh, pointing to the direction that the Russian attrition strategy, so the strategy to grind and bleed out the, defend, the Ukrainian forces defending the Donbas salient, unfortunately, this Russian strategy seems to be working at least to a certain extent. So the upcoming few days, we are going to see probably the fate of Severodonetsk decided. And, let's, and the, the main thing to watch is whether Russia will manage to progress with its effort to encircle Ukrainian defenders uh, of the Donbas salient. And again, it's not the territory that's most important here. It's the fate of the Ukrainian forces defending that, ter that territory. This is what we need to watch. My seven minutes are over. Thank you. Uh, here I stop. And if there are any questions, I'm trying my best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for your invitation. My intervention will, will, will be quick to leave as much time as possible for an exchange. Um, basically, as you have seen over the last few weeks, there's been quite a bit of focus on um, the financial efforts that could be arranged to help rebuild Ukraine uh, after the war. Uh, there's been a number of proposals, including uh, a quite important proposal to use the uh, central bank reserves of the Central Bank of Russia that have been frozen to uh, serve as a basis for uh, compensation and reparation and to help refinance uh, um, and, to, and to help finance uh, Ukraine reconstruction efforts after the war. We believe this discussion is, is useful. We have some doubts about uh, seizing uh, um, the reserves of the central bank at this particular point in time, but we can dis discuss that. But what we uh, are concerned with is that this focus on the reconstruction effort misses the importance of Ukraine's financial assistance today. Uh, Ukraine has been asking, and rightly so, uh, a number of, of, of weaponry, and the focus has been really uh, around the amount of, of uh, military spending and military uh, uh, assistance that can be provided to Ukraine, and it has somewhat missed the importance of financial assistance. 
there was a small IMF uh, support program alongside with the macro, macro financial assistance program by, uh, by the European Commission. We believe that at this point, given the fiscal needs and given the external needs, Ukraine probably needs around 5 billion euros of assistance per month. This is the external funding gap of, 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 of Ukraine. And at the moment, there is no international arrangement to be able to provide that. The EU has put together a trust fund. The EU was committed at the last G7 to commit some 9 billion euros in the macro financial assistance program. And the US has you know, uh, signed a $40 billion uh, package of which you know, about half is military spending and military assistance and the other could be civilian and could take the form of financial assistance. What is missing in our view is an overarching financial arrangement program in the form of an IMF program, because this is what the international community is most uh, used to, with very little macroeconomic conditionality, because we don't think this is the issue at this point, but that would serve as an anchor to arrange bilateral support you know, the macro financial assistance program by the European Commission on one hand, but also the mobilization of the trust fund and the use of uh, international financial resources of international financial organizations such, such as the EBRD or, or, or the EIB and, and, and the IFC. Given the financial needs, we believe this overarching macroeconomic program and macroeconomic financial assistance is absolutely necessary and we are a bit sorry that it's taking so much time to come together. There's two other things that could be done alongside this macroeconomic financial uh, uh, program, and that might be required, in fact, to unleash more financial support. One is an ECB swap line, uh, which would greatly help the, the National Bank of Ukraine to stabilize the exchange rate, but would also help um, uh, Ukrainian citizens that have fled Ukraine to be able to change their Gravenia deposits into, uh, into euros that they could be able to withdraw, whether they're in Poland or Germany or elsewhere in Europe. There's been a discussion now for more than a month and a half about, uh, about how the ECB could arrange such a swap line to help the withdrawal of euros by Ukrainian residents outside of Ukraine. And this has been desperately slow for a number of intra-political reasons in, in, inside the EU, which, uh, which we can debate. We believe this swap line is extremely important, but has to come alongside a bigger macroeconomic uh, program and could be a, a very powerful signal that the EU, including the European Central Bank, is doing everything it can to stabilize the macroeconomic situation and provide financial on top of, uh, of military uh, assistance to Ukraine. And then there is another question which will come alongside that, which is the question of uh, Ukraine's external debt. In our view, uh, if there is such a large amount of financial assistance provided to Ukraine, it is natural that the private sector plays its part too. And that uh, we have, if not a restructuring, at least a rescheduling of Ukraine's external debt obligations. Uh, it is very unlikely that the international community will provide large amounts of financial resources if these financial resources are in fact used to repay Ukraine's external debt. And so a comprehensive macroeconomic program would include large amounts of money from the international financial community an ECB swap line, and third, uh, debt rescheduling or debt restructuring arrangement. And these three things are very much tied to the hips. And at the moment, they haven't moved sufficiently. And we believe this is the key uh, for uh, Ukraine's financial uh, support in the next few months. Thank you. Just a quick comeback. So, so you're really seeing Europeans in, in the driving seat in this, um, uh, the sort of arranging or, or helping, helping, helping Ukraine financially. Because it was on the military side, it's often said that the Americans are really the ones who, who, who move the needle. No, I, I, I think the, the point we're making is that we need an, an international uh, agreement. And this international agreement basically will start by an IMF initiative. And in order for the IMF initiative to work, it has to be backed both by the U.S., and also by the EU. And then it will be complemented with bilateral resources, both by the EU and, and, and by the US. But there needs to be an organizing framework, and the organizing framework will be the IMF. Let's now turn to Veronica um, from Ukraine. 
for a Ukrainian perspective? My colleagues did a great overview. I want to add a couple of points. Uh, first of all, the situation in Ukraine, it's absolutely obvious that the uh, GDP is declining, although uh, hopefully it will not be half. According to the estimates that we are doing in our institute, my colleagues are doing in April uh, and uh, May, the GDP decline was uh, 39%, which is close to half, but actually in March it was uh, about 45. We had also January and February as fairly normal months with a growth, and we expect as the economy is adapting to the situation. Uh, and, uh, for example, exports is resuming through uh, railway, first of all, we will see some revival. Also, revival, okay, it's, it, it's revival to the previous month and definitely it's a huge drop, but not as large as we had in the first month of the war. So, Hopefully, the GDP, total GDP decline will be about one third, but it's still huge. It's still the disastrous situation. And a lot will definitely develop, depend on the military situation on ground. But in any case, the financial situation, as uh, Shine explained, is very difficult. According to According to the uh, current news, in May, the deficit of the budget was about over 200 uh, billion greeners. That means uh, about six, uh, over almost seven billion dollars. And uh, basically, that is the expected deficit for the next month as well. And the problem that we do not see that really covered by the international assistance as of now. The assistance is promised, but uh, as it is already mentioned, we do not see the uh, assistance coming uh, regularly. Uh, Ukraine is facing definitely the decline in uh, income of the government. Uh, I mean, tax are collected. VAT is much lower. Uh, Profit tax is much lower, that's clear. We have a revival of the collection of personal income tax, but uh, uh, that is not sufficient to cover all, all, all needs of the budget. And at the same time, we see almost uh, doubling of government expenses. Still, uh, while the government is using that money for only the very specific purposes, especially for security. So the need is, uh, here and I fully second the uh, suggestion that we have to be, uh, we have to organize, uh, the world has to organize the frame and coordinate the assistance. And it has to focus on both immediate needs, the budget support, and on the uh, reconstruction, because also we cannot wait with infrastructure reconstruction till the end of the war. Some spendings has to be done now. The roads have to be repaired now. Railway has to be repaired now, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that it cannot be just one step after another. There has to be parallel. And one more thing, uh, yes, I agree that the debt restructuring is needed. And second, it's very important uh, not to create additional burden. It has to be either grants or some very very long decades of the uh, grace period before the debt that is accumulated now is actually repaired because it's clear that uh, the country next year, hopefully Ukraine wins this war this year. But even in this case, the country's recovery and it will take a long time. And one more thing, it, it, it's for Europe. I think that the uh, decision that will be done on June 24th about the candidate status of Ukraine is very important because it will, if it will be a clear sign that Ukraine will join eventually, then it will be read in the European Union. It gives a very big clarity to investors. It gives a clarity for Ukrainian reform forces. It gives clarity also to Russia that actually it, it lost Ukraine, mentally, politically. 
if it's something like, yes, you're in the European family, but we will see how you perform, I'm afraid that this message will be used uh, to continue destabilizing Ukraine, not only by military, but also all other information and political uh, forces. So basically military assistance, humanitarian, financial, but also the clearly like clear political signs are important this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, the, the question of, 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 of granting Ukraine um, candidacy status um, is, is the big one coming up um, with, the, with the EU Commission preparing it, a, 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 a position which then will be sort of discussed within the Council. And um, um, my impression is that, that we are moving towards a decision where, where, which is actually positive, where we're sort of the logic of the situation wouldn't allow anything else. But um, that is uh, definitely something we will be looking into um, uh, more deeply in the next in one of the next sessions. Um, I don't know quite sure whether, whether Milan was able to join us. If so, can you make yourself heard? I don't think he is 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 on online yet. Um, so 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 maybe um, <clears throat> one question to you, Veronica. Um, is 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 sort of the general feeling in Ukraine? Um, ah, there he is. There, there, uh, Milan. Maybe Please just give us some, hello. Good morning. Please give us some some time. So uh, it's it's good to continue with Veronica. Excellent. Um, and sort of, what is the general feeling in Ukraine of sort of, of the, the the amount of assistance coming 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 from outside? Is 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 there sort of is there a feeling that this is, is this sufficient? Um, what what sort of the audiences in in, in 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 Europe sort of always sort of hear sort of um, um, the, the request for for more weapons in particular? But but the overall effort is it is it is it seen as as as, uh, as fitting and as, as sufficient? Uh, it's a difficult question. Uh, if you be hear all numbers, feeling is it's a lot, but then you come to the ground and the feeling uh, is much more different because with the military, yeah, we need more weapon and we need also these, uh, uh, they're like uh, bullets, etc. I'm not a military expert, but everything that we use to, to, to fight, not only the weapon itself, but also with the financial assistance, it's uh, it is promised, but it's not coming quickly. And then we see the numbers, it's promised, but then we go into details and it appears that it's not only for Ukraine and not only for this purpose, and it's, 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 it's a bulk assistance. So I don't think that is actually sufficient for Ukraine not to worry about economic situation, especially in the short run, because it's very difficult to cover the gaps in the uh, spending now. Thank you very much. Maybe also to, to bring Shaheen uh, uh, into this discussion. There, there are questions in the chat which sort of ask sort of um, sort of how secure would be sort of uh, efforts to reconstruct um, at least parts of, of, of the Ukrainian infrastructure and, and conse uh, consequently the, the, um, the, the economy. Um, would it be safe uh, uh, to do so, um, um, given that, that Russia might be tempted to immediately destroy um, uh, the sort of new constructions again? And added to that, um, is there sort of is this a chance for, for, for Ukraine to change its, its, its sort of basic um, economic model, sort of looking looking to, to, to clean energy as well? Maybe, Shine, you want to, yeah. to pick on that? No, quickly. So, in, in my mind, we should draw a distinction uh, between the financial to rebuild Ukraine and these efforts but should, should wait at least for the biggest part of the conflict to have ended. And I don't think we're in that situation yet. And the immediate financial assistance to pay um, uh, Ukrainian uh, soldiers, to pay Ukrainian civil servants, and to have the basic functioning of the state, whether it is health services or other, continue to, to operate. And so I think these emergency, uh, uh, this emergency financial assistance is required now. And I think it's, it's very clear that it has been promised several times. I'm afraid we are losing you, Shaheen. Maybe we give it to Veronica for a moment uh, until you sort of the connection comes back. But we get, we get, get the point that, that, that much promises were made or many promises were made, but not, not all of them fulfilled. Veronica. Yeah. 
yes, that's that's my understanding as well that the money is not coming as as quickly as uh, promised, and that is a crazy question. Also, I'm not fully agree with Shay that emergency need do not include infrastructure. Definitely, it's very hard to. Uh, repair everything properly but something has to be repaired because we need to ensure that the country is functioning and it means that despite the risk of additional destructions the bridges have to put in operation roads have to be put in operation and also about the economic restructuring and modernization everybody is saying now that ukraine has to be rebuilt into the like new quality uh, using uh, to be rebuilt green etc cetera, etc cetera. it's something this same discussion as occurred two years ago then covid started and the discussion in europe was that the countries have to the eu itself has to not to return to the usual business but to choose the other path the same is happening in ukraine and uh, i think uh, uh, as the uh, enterprises are relocated and as some businesses are starting a new invest in Ukraine, which is somewhat safer, or in Kiev, which is much better protected from missiles. This idea of a new kind has to be uh, clearly explored, the same as the energy reconstruction. And that comes to the another thing where the uh, Europe and actually the world can help not only financial assistance, not only grants, insurance. This is one of the key things for business to operate and insurance to cover some military risks, uh, which is not usually insured, uh, can help to ensure that businesses are starting operations here. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, now let's go to Shiti now and Milan and Anastasia. Good morning. Uh, so I'm here with uh, uh, Anastasia. Um, we are having meetings with the uh, local stakeholders, some ministers, uh, think tankers, because this trip is part of our um, think tank network on the future of uh, Eastern Partnership or its neighborhood. Uh, we are here also with Stefan Meister, but he's meeting a minister right now. Um, so Moldova, just very basic facts. Uh, Moldova is a country of uh, about 3 million uh, people stuck in between um, Southwestern Ukraine and Romania, it is feeling direct impact of the war. And it will also be uh, hugely influenced by the future reconstruction of Ukraine, uh, economically in terms of infrastructure and so on. Um, I would say that the, the one thing discussed, there are two issues at the top of our discussion, um, the social energy situation and the parallel crisis that Anastasia will talk about in a minute. And second thing is the membership, the EU membership application that the Moldovan government submitted uh, a few weeks ago, and they are awaiting a decision from the European Council summit uh, on the 24th of June. This um, ap membership application was submitted by Moldova after some hesitation. Uh, they, they, they felt not having too much choice after Ukraine submitted this application for obvious reasons, and then Georgia jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, Moldova has a pro-EU, a reform government may be the most reformed government in, in decades, but it's also for the government is a matter of survival for the next few months. And the IMF already suggested the direct budgets of budgetary support. They really need more than or in the same way as they are waiting a decision on the candidate status uh, from Brussels. They are awaiting a concrete um, uh, assistance and financial uh, measures to survive the next few months. Over to Nastya, maybe. Hi, uh, thank you, Milan. Uh, I'm also a research fellow at the GAPE and I'm working on the Eastern Partnership Think Tank Network uh, together with Milan and Stefan. So very briefly on Moldova and a bit more in, on the crisis, what we've heard yesterday that basically is Moldova is a collateral damage to what happens in the region. And that's how the government feels here and also the people. In a way, there is a feeling that there is little control on what's going to happen and a lot of reliance on the external support. Moldova is currently dealing with three crises. There is an energy crisis which has started already last year when Gazprom didn't want to extend the contract with Moldova. And the current extension is like up to a year and then the price has to be renegotiated. 
What we have learned is not the problem of connectivity and that Moldova cannot buy other sources of gas. They can, but they can't afford it. So it's really a social problem and the problem of prices of gas that exist. This is one crisis. Second crisis is the economic crisis. In March, the inflation reached 27% and it's predicted to be increasing. Therefore, the prices have been growing every day, basically. That's what we hear from people. And, uh, and the salaries are not. So the inflation is very high and uh, the, the economy is not having very positive prospects, basically. This is both affected, uh, this is both the effect of the war in Ukraine and also the internal economic situation in Moldova. On top of this, Moldova has been dealing with the refugee crisis since March. Uh, as Milan mentioned, a country of 3 million people, even less, Moldova doesn't have any experience of dealing with refugees. And so far, it hosted around 100,000 people and 350,000 people left the country and passed through Moldova. Therefore, they also needed the support. Uh, in, this, in this slide, Moldova submitted the application for the EU. And the current, uh, the current situation is that Moldova understands that maybe the full membership won't be granted, but there is a need for some roadmap or concrete plans because people in the government are already sort of there is a fatigue on promises that they hear from the EU partners, but so far not more has come than words. We, we read in the news that a lot of, there is a lot of support. However, a lot of it is channeled through the other institutions and not so much through the government. The refugee support went through UNHCR and UN, other UN institutions. Uh, therefore, therefore, the current risk is that there will be a destabilization. There might be protests either in autumn or if people survive the winter and the high gas prices, there, there can be protests in spring and summer. So this is very brief. <laughs> Maybe uh, one more point to connect with our briefings. Uh, last week, you heard a lot about the uh, food crisis and uh, the efforts, uh, huge efforts to get grain out of Ukraine. So these efforts are going also through Moldova, uh, mostly through track, uh, uh, through roads which is very inadequate to the amounts that are stuck in Ukraine around Odessa region, which is next to Moldova. Uh, but we heard yesterday that although the trucks are still moving through Moldova to the uh, Romanian ports, now the bottleneck or the blockages in the ports uh, in Romania, uh, Constanza is clocked, basically. And, um, and then the second important thing is Transnistria. So in the territory of Moldova, there is a there is a, a self-proclaimed Republic of Transnistria supported by Moscow. There were uh, various incidents, so the, 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 the explosions and so on. Um, nobody was hurt. It was probably designed not to hurt anybody, but there is an attempt to destabilize the uh, situation in Moldova these days through Transnistria. And if I just may briefly add, at the same time, because the border between uh, Transnistria and Ukraine is both from the Ukrainian side, Transnistria is now more than ever dependent on the Moldovan official government. Therefore, they also have, in a way, there is maybe a window of opportunity to have more cooperation. So thank you for giving us the opportunity. As you can, as you can see, we can go on. But over to over to you, to Berlin, Helen. Thank, thank you very much, you both. Um, um, now joining us from from Chisinau. now um, um, we have about um, 20 minutes left for for discussion so please raise your hands to 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 put uh, questions directly to our panel or, um, or or sort of put your questions in the chat and I'll try to to put them to the panel um, if you need a few more minutes to to think what you what you want uh, to ask maybe maybe we can sort of what we what we heard from Moldova I think suggests to us that that that, that the EU really needs a sort of a, 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 a encompassing approach, a sort of a broadening its its scope and, and not thinking of each country individually. Do you think that 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 makes sense, Shaheen? I think it does, and and I think it's useful that you brought up the question of the accession talks, um, uh, and the important decision that the European Council will have to take on June twenty fourth. You may have seen a speech by Macron, which I think has created a bit of uh, commotion in Europe about the creation of a European political community, which would be the idea of precisely treating all of the <laughs> newly uh, exceeding members in a similar fashion and to basically accelerate them joining this community rather than joining the EU. And, and I think this is creating a lot of debate. And I think the key to a positive uh, accession talk 
uh, uh, discussion being launched on June 24th will be also some response by the other European member states to this idea by Macron of basically creating a, a concentric circle uh, Europe, whereby the core or the avant-garde can integrate more deeply while um, the uh, EU or the European politi political community continues to expand to the countries that are uh, in accession talks. I think that's a very critical issue. Um, it hasn't been discussed very much, so I'm somewhat concerned that the June 24th meeting by the heads of state will not have had the opportunity of more detailed intellectual or administrative uh, preparation. The French, uh, with the speech, uh, have been very bold. It's not very clear what Macron means by this European political community. And so far, the response has been fairly cold. There has been a non-paper by about a dozen countries uh, refusing the idea of a European convention and basically Europe, you're refusing the idea of having a profound discussion on European institutions. And there's been a second paper by uh, led by Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, and a few others suggesting that we should take our time to have this discussion about the institutional evolutions of the EU uh, and that this should be you know, fully embedded into the continuation of the work on the conference on the future of Europe. And so I think I see the asking for some and for this idea of the European political community before agreeing to uh, Ukraine's accession. Uh, Unfortunately, Shaheen, we can't hear you again. But I think your points were quite clear that there's more in this suggestion by, by, by Macron, which he uh, sort of made in his speech uh, to the European Parliament on Europe Day um, um, in, in early May, um, this idea of having a, a, um, a political community as a kind of uh, sort of outer core, uh, sort of so have an have EU in the middle and, 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 and a sort of a circle of, 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 of more European countries, which aren't members yet, but uh, to build the sort of outer core. Um, uh, Veronica, is that something which, which just sort of is, 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 uh, is, is um, would, would, I don't know, satisfy for Ukraine? Um, um, or, 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 or do you see it more as some others in Central and Eastern Europe have seen it as a kind of creation of a, of a, of a two, um, two class Europe. Uh, yeah, the Macron speech was not very clear what is meant because he also mentioned UK, Turkey. So it's it's it's, it's a huge idea, and it's not very uh, specific idea. Uh, I, with my colleagues, uh, basically not I, the Michael Emerson, the colleague with whom I, from SAPS uh, Brussels, with whom I work for many years, we are suggesting another approach here. And we even prepared recently the opinion piece just suggesting what EU should, uh, European Commission should say, that uh, the candidate status have to be followed by the like uh, stage accession, not everything at immediately somewhere in the end of the process, but something like stages that allow country to gradually integrate into the European institutions with uh, like better presence on discussions uh, regarding new regulations in the years where countries are perform good, uh, the uh, better access to funds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, basically, the suggestion is not only for Ukraine or the uh, three DCFTA countries, but also for Balkans that have been stuck in their uh, accession process for the uh, years. So I think that uh, so the idea of Macron and the idea of like how to reform the EU in order to make it more efficient in their decision is hugely important, but it's not for me in Ukraine to say how the EU has to do that. I fully agree that it's it has to be the intra-European discussion, but I don't think that the decision about these candidate status has to be conditioned upon the completion of this discussion because then it will be never ending story again. So it should be, it should be, the EU has to recognize that the uh, geopolitics returned, want we or not, or do not want, and that uh, some clear path has to be established for the countries while still uh, we have uh, 
huge EU has a huge discussion internally how to reform it. It actually started before the war, and they have to be probably continued disregarding the war. Thank you very much. Milan, you want to come in? Yes, thank you. I don't want to comment uh, the idea of French President Macron created a huge discussion. For some people, it was not well thought through and coordinated in the EU, but it's internal EU discussion. Uh, what I want to say is, in addition to Veronica, uh, on the candidate status or the decision uh, in uh, in few weeks from Brussels, I think in Moldova, they are very realistic that any step forward on their European perspective is a plus, even if it's potential candidate status, as long as they are moved from the uh, neighborhood dossier to the pre-accession or accession dossier, it's already, they understand that it's a long, it's a marathon, that it's uh, it's good for them. However, when, when we ask them if they have started with some kind of a management expectation, expectation management for the population, they are doing something, but they also, they also understand that they are pinned to Ukraine, to the big decision and attention they will be on Ukraine. And maybe a question to Veronica. One thing where Moldova is really uh, dependent on Ukraine is the export of electricity. Imagine, we, I learned just here that a country uh, in war like Ukraine is still exporting electricity to its neighbors as long as they control their electricity plants. And if you can just enlighten us what infrastructure in Ukraine is under threat now, the, the big one in Zaporozhye, nuclear power plants, where uh, shortly taken by, by the Russian forces and then cut out from the grid. But what is the prospect uh, in, uh, in this part of Ukraine across the border uh, um, around this? So how, how sort of reliant can Moldova be on Ukraine for the electricity? Uh, uh, I, I'm, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, regarding electricity, I'm sure that Moldova can be reliant because uh, Ukraine uh, has basically oversupply of electricity now. Ukraine is producing uh, about half of its electricity from uh, nuclear power plants and even with Zaporizhia. Also, I'm not sure fully that it's actually caught out of uh, uh, the grid. It's caught by the Russians and controlled by the Russians, but I'm not sure that they are not uh, they are fully cut out. But maybe I missed some recent news. Uh, but in any case, even without Zaporizhia, Ukraine has oversupply because uh, you, you cannot like easily stop all these uh, uh, like nuclear power plants. And you, 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 you're, we have that. And we also have uh, the, all the other sources, including um, uh, the uh, production of uh, electricity from gas and coal. And we wanted not only to supply that to Ukraine, uh, to Moldova, we wanted to export that to EU, although it's not fully technically possible now, but the talks are ongoing. Uh, the major, we will see how uh, the situation will be uh, in winter, but I'm sure electricity will continue. The problem in Ukraine might be with the heating uh, because uh, Ukraine needs coal for that and the supplies are not very easy. Also, I just learned that uh, Ukraine, you, you probably know Ukraine, we are buying some of the nuclear, these nuclear rods. This is a fuel for nuclear power plants from Russia. Now it's fully discontinued. And Ukraine and Western East House announced that Western East House supply all nuclear rods for, to Ukraine, but that needs some technical adjustment. I don't know how fast it will happen. But still, I'm sure that regarding, uh, electricity situation is quite stable the problem with gas the problem with heating and that now we are in june but we still it's it's a perfect time to think how it will happen in a couple months later so far ukraine controls most of its uh, like infrastructure on the, and most of infrastructure on non-occupied territory. Definitely, we always have the threat of shelling, uh, hopefully not for nuclear power plants, but definitely for other power plants. But so far, thanks God, it's not happening. 
you very much. Um, I thought we'd sort of Mila had skipped the, the, the question about, about the, the two, two, two speed Europe or sort of, um, but um, maybe let's just come, come back to it in sort of wider, wider sense that um, if we, 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 what we're already seeing is that sort of economic um, uh, relations between Russia and the rest of Europe is really coming to a, to a standstill. Some, some, some say that it's a, it's a sort of uh, an iron curtain coming up economically, at least uh, between, between Russia and the rest. And this sort of necessitates, doesn't it? Uh, a sort of, a, a, a sort of more advanced uh, integration economically as well of, of, of the, the states in between. Um, then we have a very sort of, as, as a little advertisement of the upcoming issues of international politics and international politics quarterly, we made a, we had a pleasure of, of doing an interview with uh, Jaroslav Kurfürst, who is involved in preparing the Czech EU presidency coming up um, um, in, uh, from July, taking over from, from France. And um, one of the points he made was that, that he thinks, and many others in Central and Eastern Europe think, that it's, it's not possible anymore since the war started to have a kind of um, leave countries in, in a geopolitical uh, nowhere land. And, and, and that, that um, whatever happens um, uh, in the candidate status and, and beyond, that, that uh, this needs to be addressed. And, um, and do, you, do you see, um, maybe Milan, maybe Veronica, maybe Anastasia, do you see um, any moves or, or a greater realization in Brussels that, that this actually is required? Who wants to go first? Moldova is a neutral country and its neutral status is very much uh, the, the key part of its uh, equilibrium, internal equilibrium. You have one part of the society which is very pro-Western, also it's a, it has you know, two languages, Romanian and Russian. Um, so the, the support for the EU is just above 50%, but there is no question about NATO. Uh, and also uh, in order to continue the equilibrium, the other part of society is you know, very much want to be out of the of, of the war and or, or do anything uh, that could give uh, Russia a pretext to squeeze out Moldova. So the the government line is um, not to uh, supply any any weapons to to Ukraine, not to even use uh, the territory of Moldova for for supplies, even the spare parts. So they are very careful, and they will they are very amendment not to not to move towards NATO in any way. But at the same time, they know that the era of these gray zones in, the, in Europe is over. And if you if you if you look at the Russian discussion, that's what you hear from Moscow. That we will we will sort of put down the, the if not the iron curtain again, then some kind of a curtain. And countries have to choose. And so therefore, the EU perspective is the only thing left for 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 Moldova. And also, it has a among twenty seven member states, it has a very strong partner in Romania, which. Uh, sort of sees um, the future of Mol Moldova as part of its own security and part of its own sort of maybe pol political future. Um, and not to speak about the security situation in the wider uh, Black Sea region, which Moldova is part of. So it's a uh, geopolitically, it's a very clear challenge for the EU. For me, one of the questions I'm bringing um, back to Berlin from this, uh, from this trip is that you have now a government which is not only very pro-EU, but very much anti-corruption. You cannot have more crazy people in government trying to, uh, to to wipe out corruption, but they also need help from outside. And <laughs> that is very slow coming. So there was a donor conference organized after the, the, the visit of Annalena Baerbock, German foreign, federal foreign minister here. Berlin uh, took an initiative and organized a donor conference. Uh, and we were asking for the results, what really came out of that pledges? Well. They are slow coming, and only two countries, Poland and 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 and, and Germany, pledged uh, a concrete immediate, immediate help. So in Europe, we are all busy with other problems, and we are sometimes sort of slow to come to help not only to Ukraine, which is in war, but also the immediate neighbors that can be destabilized by 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 the war and by Russia, because there is also disinformation campaign and other campaigns going on, which will. Which which are designed to 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 make things more difficult here. And I just can briefly add, when the EU doesn't offer a clear roadmap or a clear future, there is a gap. So you know where should Moldova turn then? And then there is only Russia towards the east. And I think now there is like as, as Milan mentioned, and that's what we've heard before from all our interlocutors. There shouldn't be a gray zone. So in terms of neutrality, 
towards NATO, yes, but in terms of the orientation towards more towards West or East, Moldova has made a clear choice and the government is articulating it at every possible opportunity. At the same time, energy-wise and economically-wise, there is no, no plan. The government is just unable now to say what's going to happen after winter. And while we speak in Germany or in France that the gas prices are going to rise, the comparative increase of gas prices to Germany and the comparative increase to gas prices in Moldova is just, there is a very big discrepancy. For instance, in winter, Moldovans are expected to pay 50% of their salary just for electricity and for heating. So imagine, uh, imagine the, um, uh, the way people perceive it and how this puts also strains the government because they have to choose. They, they should also continue buying the gas with Gazprom and try to negotiate the deal while they are also negotiating the EU accession. So the Russian narrative here to... One part of the population is that, of course, we can offer you better energy deal than, than Europe ever can offer you. And second, look, they don't want you. The, the, the Western Europeans don't see you as part of Europe. Uh, you can always turn to us and we can sustain you economically. What they don't say in the Russian channels is that you will lose your sovereignty. And that's the basic that's the basic sort of offer for for a country like like Moldova and uh, we should not underestimate the strength of the of these Russian narratives here they they are also fighting for the hearts and minds of, of of populations like here they don't see this government lasting too long they will try to make sure that they will they will hit uh, more problems and the interesting thing that happened is when the war started and there were sanctions towards Russia uh, Russia removed some sanctions from Moldova for some fruit export so suddenly Moldovan fruits could comply with the Russian criteria to export, you know? So this is like, this is how it works, basically. It's either that or this. Thank you very much. Uh, with, with, a, with an eye on the time, um, we've got uh, four minutes left. Uh, I wanted to give uh, Shaheen another um, opportunity to, to address this question of whether, whether Macron's proposals would sort of get rid of gray zones, geopolitical ones, um, uh, also, also geoeconomic ones, uh, uh, between what is now the EU and what is Russia. Um, or, or would that, that, that not leave um, those countries in, in a sort of kind of uh, in-between uh, land again? No, I, I think the, 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 the point, the whole point of Macron's proposal is precisely to end this gray zone and to be more forthcoming and welcoming to, to, to countries that are currently in the eastern, in eastern neighborhood by providing a framework that allows both to include them but also that allows the EU to deepen its integration. I think the big concern of Macron, which, which I share actually, is that by adding, let's say, about 10 new countries to the EU in, a country, in, a, in an EU that is already fairly dysfunctional and, and, and largely hijacked by uh, veto rights, we would just make the EU even more ungovernable than it is today. And so I think Macro's point is we can only enlarge the EU if we have a framework to deepen it. And the framework to deepen it is this convention to basically get rid of, of, of veto rights and enhance the power of qualified majority voting as much as possible. So I think in Macron's mind, the two come together and, and doing the enlargement bit only without the deepening would actually be leading to the long-term enfeebling of, of Europe. And I think Think he has a valid point and I think his big concern in terms of timing is if I give the candidate status now uh, without a commitment by the others to move on uh, on deepening then I've lost any window for deepening the EU in the future and I think that's a valid comment and then last point there was a, a some quite some Q&A on the on, uh, some questions on the chat about what should we do with the uh, reserves that, uh, that were seized from Russia um, my, my view is that while these will uh, very likely be part of a, of, a, of a deal and a ceasefire in the end and will be part of reparations, I think it is unwise to use this money today, to use the money that has been frozen and seize it now. I think it has to be seized as part of a ceasefire rather than seized unilaterally, because the danger of seizing it unilaterally is that you increase uh, the willingness of Russia to basically destroy as much as possible of, of, of Ukraine. Well, I think if you wait for that money until a ceasefire is, is, is secure, then you have some chance of a negotiated solution uh, that includes some reparation uh, with, through the confiscation of these reserves. And that's it for me. 
Thank you very much, Shaheen. Sort of, Milan is always sort of firing back on the chat, sort of. <laughs> but I think this is an argument we will, we will be very looking forward to, to addressing in, in a full session, very, very maybe next next week or the week after. Um, but um, uh, since we've got only a, a minute left, let's go to to Victoria for a sort of final final word um, on, on 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 you already sort of explain the expectations of Ukraine towards the EU, towards Europe, and, and what would be the, the, the single most welcomed step um, which, which could be given to Ukraine uh, in, in, in June and beyond? You're asking a huge question. The single most important, I think, is the clear candidate status, because it creates the frame for all of that, if it's single. But we are the all financial, military, humanitarian aid, has to continue and has to be framed. Here I agree with Sharon. All right, thank you very much. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. Thank you very much for, for joining us again this morning. It's a long running series now and, and we of course uh, hope to continue it. Um, um, thanks to our uh, excellent speakers. Andras had already uh, had to leave us, um, but we, we were joined by Veronica, by she, uh, Shaheen, and by, uh, by Milan and Anastasia. Um, thank you all very much for your for, 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 for lively discussion. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. I wish you a very good morning and see you soon at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you.